Hello, 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 guys. Welcome to this new edition of Mind Podcast. This is Adit Kapadia, and I come to you on a very strange week. Uh, it's a week of uh, disbelief amongst many quarters of the world, skepticism, abject fear in some parts, and confusion and chaos. Um, I'm, of course, referring to the situation in Afghanistan, and it is scary, it is unpredictable, and Anyone who tells you they know what's going on is either flat out lying or not, you know, or isn't aware of the complexity of the problem in Afghanistan. Uh, this podcast is not going to solve all the issues. It's not going to talk about every single issue on it. We, I mean, we're going to cover as much as we can, but this is essentially going to be a series of discussions that I have with experts activists, many people from Afghanistan um, get different points of views and then, uh, you know, bring it to you guys and then you write to us. I I don't want to, you know, sit and give my point of view right now because there are so many more people out there who are on the ground, have information and, you know, have so much to add to the discussion. So we want to amplify the voices. We want to join in, ask them questions and hopefully, you know, get answers and please write to us about that. But with me kicking off this series of podcasts is um, Leima Murtaza. She is a uh, she is an activist and a international uh, uh, she, uh, interna- a humanitarian aid uh, professional. She's an Afghan American activist. Uh, she is based uh, right now on this side of the world, but has was you know has traveled to Afghanistan many many times most recently being 2019 and has worked there so thank you Leima thank you for giving us the time thank you for uh, it this cannot have been could not have been a tough easy week for you it's very tough but I appreciate you giving us the time to talk about these issues Thank you so much for having me and amplifying Afghan voices. I think what we're seeing in the media is a domination of the Western lens. And I'd really I'd like to help uh, contribute to some fact checks with you. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let me, let me, you know, let's, without further ado, let's first ask the basic question. Are we getting relevant information? I mean, uh, the obvious answer is no, but are we only getting Kabul specific information from Afghanistan? There are five other major cities in Afghanistan. Like I'm talking about big cities, right? And then there are many, many provinces, probably a thousand small cities, villages and stuff. Are we hearing much from them or is the Western media just reporting what they are hearing from Kabul? So there's two elements here. Um, as of right now, there's a lot of misinformation, and I believe it's on purpose. There's a misinformation campaign ensuing between the West, the East, um, and interested parties. Mm-hmm. So there's there's rumors, there's um, purposely um, information being shared to scare people, to, to get people to do the wrong things, like going to the airport when you shouldn't, and, and so on. Um, and, and that has to be clarified as well, that we have to be very careful with the information that we're reading. In terms of the West, I mean, it's also a mix. Um, you have some Western media outlets saying, what a shame, um, really mm-hmm. amplifying the catastrophe that's at hand. And then you have another part of Western media that is trying to whitewash the Taliban, their crimes, saying that they are um, changed or 2.0 version Um which is just shocking to me, given that, you know, 25 years of, of the brutality that they have ensued during this war and during their five year reign, how do they just change their behavior within five days? And honestly, they have not on the ground. And this is not some computer and software that you just go 2.0 and 1.0 and things like that. Um, uh, there is an Indian journalist who did uh, a leadership on who Taliban, and a lot of them, many of them were actually fighters during the 96 to 2000 period when the Taliban ruled. So how can Taliban 2.0 be if there are people who have had roots in that struggle, right? I mean, it's the same people coming. And the real question you have to ask or the American media has to ask is, where were they? Were they in Afghanistan? Did they cross over the border to some other place? And if so, what was America doing about it? But those are deeper questions that need more examination. What I really wanted to ask uh, you, Lena, on this um, issue is, the Western media seems to be still very 
um, still it's all it's behaving like it it is an arm of the US government in terms of how they cover Afghanistan because Biden said so half the people like I someone was um, uh, sending a piece by Tom Friedman in 2001 uh, when he wrote in New York Times that uh, we have to trust Bush on the war in Afghanistan and how this is going to be a, a long war but they have a plan now I'm not going into whether they had a plan for the war or not but it seems like they did not have an exit plan and abandoning Bagram Air Base the way they did overnight, I I I cannot imagine. I'm no strategic expert, but isn't that just a giving the Taliban a walkover? Like not like you know a really what was going on? And right now all we see is chaos. So what have you been hearing? Like is there just abject fear because of the way the whole thing was was being handled there? There's abject fear of one, the way it was handled, two, on top of that, this idea of the whitewashing of the Taliban. I, I think Afghans feel like they've been handed over to the Taliban and they know the type of regime that they have um, held in the past. And so I think both of those combined, I mean, the reason they want to go to the airport is because of that fear. Now, let me be clear, there are Afghans on the ground who aren't as scared because they're so used to war for the last 20 years that they mm -hmm. actually welcome the the uh, stability and calmness that there is not an active war happening um, in, in across the country. But I think there are many people who were paid by U.S. funded programs and, and uh, other country programs that have every right to be fearful because of what they're hearing and what they're seeing is that the Taliban is going into people's homes. They have a list of people who worked for foreign entities or worked for the army or worked for the police and, and are seen as targets. Um, and what we're seeing is even people who uh, are uh, higher in, in leadership or well known as, as community leaders are now giving their allegiance to the Taliban. This is all out of sheer fear. Um, there, there is a panic. Um, I, I'm still very close in touch with former colleagues and friends and even some family members of trying to get out immediately. Um, they're sharing stories of what they're seeing on the street. They say people when they're going out to the market to get food because they have to go out that there is like a silence and fear washed over their faces. You're not talking to them, but you see it and feel it. Yeah, and, 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 and this has been the problem, like not just on the American left over here in terms of like the media coverage, like on in India too, like we see there was a there was a guy who's, you know, um, even has written or appeared on Global Times or something like that. So, you know, very far out there uh, said, unless we recognize the Taliban as Islam inspired Afghan patriots. And I just could not believe he actually put that in a piece or that that piece got published like every i mean i thought it was satire for like you know the first few minutes but then he actually tried anyways it's the piece is out there and i don't want to plug the piece my point is how can you whitewash and, and then how can you condone it with saying oh i'm not uh, or how can you justify it by saying i'm not condoning what they did in 96 to 2001 for a force like Taliban, even if you assume that they are going to change or something, you first have to approach by what we know. And what we know is the record from 96 to 2001. Then you ask the questions. You don't just assume that, oh, it will be all hunky-dory. But if it goes back to 96, we must act. That is just naive and absolutely ridiculous if people say things like that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the first thing... <laughs> that I laughed about is that there is a white man who is not Muslim telling Afghans and the world who are Muslims are listening that this is Islamic patriotism. It is absolutely yeah. not. Yeah, the, 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 this, this, yeah, this was an Indian guy called Sudhindra Kulkarni. Not just. But to okay, sorry. Out. You but, know yeah, what? A, a non-Muslim, yeah. otherwise. Yeah, but thank you for, for correcting me. Um, yeah. The point is, I, I think many Muslims around the world know their own religion. And, and yeah. uh, I think they understand that we, there's, we know that there's many interpretations of Sharia law because it, it uh, depends on who is creating the fatwa or, or the decision made. But this is not the way that, uh, that, yeah, that and Taliban also this is not This is not even the time to go into the debate or something like that. Ultimately, we have to look at what the situation is on the ground. And yeah. You have to view, uh, so the, it just is bizarre that all these things are getting like space, right? The debate should be 
what next for Afghanistan? Because Afghanistan, people think that it is some homogenous identity, but the amount of tri the tribes, the areas controlled by certain tribes, uh, parts of the tribes, then you have the whole warlord component. So it's not as easy as it seems to be, right? And uh, so I, I, I want you to elaborate a little bit of that, Leva, like how diverse is Afghanistan in terms of the regions you know, there are sectarian differences as well. So it's not like uh, it, it's one and identity that's just controlling the entire country. Yeah, so there are many differences in, in you know, the geographical regions of the, of the type of uh, terrain that's in each um, province and, and so on that also like changes the way that people act because of access to them. Uh, mm -hmm. We have so many different ethnicities and, and yes, tribes. But honestly, if we look back at an academic lens, um, it's all the differences and, and problems that arise between them are more related to resources and power. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we have had people who have intermarried uh, tribes between different ethnicities and, and different religions and, and, and when I actually not different religions, different sects. Um, Sunni and Shia has never been a real problem for Afghans, but for the mm -hmm. Shia community, they have been constantly targeted by uh, ISIS and and even the Taliban. So um, mm -hmm. there there are issues related um, to those kind of crimes. Yeah. The the difference is yes, there there is one ruling uh, what we've seen in history one ruling class that are the Pashtuns um, however you know in every province there's a mix of uh, Pashtuns, Azoras, Tajiks, Uzbeks and so on so we'll have in the north uh, the Tajik and uh, Uzbek you'll, but also across the country and then you'll have the Pashtuns in the east the south and also yeah. the, the west so I mean depending on and also their opinions are very different as well. I think there was a lot yeah. of loyalty to the current president. You know, there still yeah. is some loyalty, but it's not it's not monolithic. Yeah. No. So that's what I'm coming towards. Like it's not monolithic and homogeneous like um, uh, America would like to believe. And as as an Indian, I have spent half my life here just kind of telling people that there is no uh, language like Indian <laughs> that we speak. It's multiple languages, right? Uh, so it's it's. I mean, it's unbelievable. Um, so, so, so so that's that, that's the first. Um, first issue that we face. The second, and I, uh, this is what sort of troubles me, is the misunderstanding of the situation on the ground, right? So like, like you very correctly pointed out, there is one part of the West that wants to almost lay all the blame on uh, somehow just blame the predecessors of Mr. Biden or the Afghan army or some stuff like that. Now, you can blame, you can pick out certain decisions. And of course, you know, you can say that, okay, this was a good decision. This was a wrong decision and stuff like that. But rather than just try making blanket statements on 5% of information that we have, it seems like no one in the Western media wants to get into the cause of how or why there was an abandoning of the posts or how certain cities were taken over, but how are we not getting information from those cities that are taken over? Or how are there protests still in Jalalabad where in one case the Taliban flag was taken down and the Afghan flag um, was put in, right? So it's like these questions are not being asked. Yeah. You're, you're absolutely right. I, I mean, I think Afghans are extremely shocked about how quickly that... Um, each province was taken over and and we realized immediately once um the taliban took over logar which is um a neighbor to kabul province that we all have been lied to we mm. knew immediately that there had been backdoor conversations happening and the army was told to give up the provinces um, from the governor who is getting strategic information from the central government. And so, I mean, that was just clear by, by what happened. Uh, we are obviously not known as a culture who would ever stand down to any external force. And it's very clear even by our army that they refer to Pakistan as, I don't mean to, to say this, but one uh, army soldier had been 
crying in a video that has been circulating that he didn't want to give up um, and not fight against the Punjabi. So, I mean, I, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with Punjabi um, people of Pakistan, but the point is that people refer to the enemy as Pakistan in Afghanistan as being the proxy and support to the Taliban. And, mm -hmm. it, and this kind of gives a different narrative is are Taliban homegrown? Are they actually an Afghan local movement? And that's the other misinformation yeah. that's being shared. And so I think uh, with the amount of trolls, uh, I like of uh, on on social media of um, the the pickup of this misinformation campaign and mm -hmm. the fear tactics that are are being set, it just confirms that these kind of um, back like backdoor conversations were happening. Uh, and, and I mean, this this is all within the realm of speculation right now, but this is what, you know, uh, people have picked up, uh, like, what you say you've heard. What is interesting is also in the whole Pakistan question, when you hear when Biden was the vice president, of course, Bin Laden was found in Abbottabad, Pakistan, and was, uh, uh, you know, the US forces killed him there. My question is, what has happened after that? after success of Obama had four more years, Trump had and now Biden has, has, has Pakistan been made aware that, you know, their ground should not be used for, you know, um, a, for uh, uh, such breeding of such groups and so forth. Uh, the second, uh, the second part of this is you have the Tehrike Taliban Pakistan the, or the TTP within Pakistan that the Pakistani establishment is not fans of, but they have not been taking on the Taliban so vociferously. So how can you be, you know, completely against one organization, but are not so against the other organization? There's that dichotomy. And Mr. Qureshi, I think, at least on uh, Twitter, I read that he was about to go to Kabul in the next week or something, who's the foreign minister of Pakistan, which may or may not be, you know, hold. But I, I suspect that the stance of Pakistan might have also been to do with what China has been doing vis-a-vis -vis Taliban, where they have not been, you know, for the, they actually are probably five, the closest to recognizing the government without knowing even who is going to lead the government or who is in charge, at least by the statements. So maybe that, that, that's what my assumption is. Would you agree? No. no. I think <laughs> Pakistan has had a very strong hand in what's happening. I think yeah. they are duplicitous in their messaging and what they have said over the years. We can find yeah. countless public statements of yeah. them saying that uh, we we can convince the, the Taliban, um, we can tell them to you know, stop their their efforts in Afghanistan, and then years later, tell that we don't have control of them. So I, yeah. I don't I absolutely think that there are ISI back that there is a plan. And and we're going to see that as things unfold over the years. I, I have yeah. no, I just want people listening to this podcast to remember that and to pay mm -hmm. attention to the news that are going to unfold over the years, because the truth will come out. Yeah. No, and, and, and I mean, the, the, that's that's what I was coming towards, that basically, like, I, I, I personally, like, right now, as you said, we don't have any information, but I'm saying there, because of their relationship with China and what China's role has been here, or the statements that it's made, it seems like, you know, that's what's emboldening the stands or, you know, maybe helping. But um, moving to the... Uh, sorry, sorry yeah. can I just say something? No, no, uh, please, China, please. China has a way of conducting business that doesn't hold any ethical or moral direction. So I, I wouldn't um, put any emphasis on the way that they're going to make decisions. China comes first to them. Human lives do not. We've seen that with the Uyghur situation and other uh, journalists who have tried to um, showcase uh, some some flaws under the ch uh, Chinese regime and uh, they have been shut down or either killed. So I wouldn't trust um, their their direction of, of the way that they're going to be allies with who and, and what and how. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's that's the you know situation of the world, but of the geopolitical part of it. But coming back to the coming back to the Afghanistan uh, people question, right? You, there are rumors of a resistance around the Panjshir, of course, um, with Tamarullah saying the statement he has on, you know, on Twitter about the constitution of, I'm assuming that is his official account. It's not verified. So I, I have to assume with what I read and then Ahmed Masood writing uh, op-ed in Washington Post and all there. But that is the 
just what's happening in Panjshir. There are other parts of Afghanistan also that are not under the focus of the Western media. So there could we is there a real possibility that they might go back to the 1996 to 2001 type situation where they might be and in this time without the fear of being sort of attacked or without having the help like the th without the fear of the west in the taliban so you know they might be uh, sort of going more aggressive on that they're like who's going to come and prevent type of thing I mean, i'm just you know asking questions here so one thing that I'd like to clarify is that Amrullah Saleh has kind of been um, pushed out of, of the resistance movement. Um, mm -hmm. He has not been a, close to um, the, the movement, uh, the anti-President Ghani movement um, since maybe 2015, 2014. They, they had a, a separation. Um, and so Amrullah Saleh had a different way of uh, the vice president of Afghanistan of, of mm -hmm. wanting to serve his nation. And I think he felt that if he joined the Ghani administration, he would be able to have more impact. Mm -hmm. And while he was serving, he had a bigger mouthpiece of anti-Pakistan rhetoric. Um, mm. the, the Ma Ahman Masood's, uh, group are more of, a more of a local resistance, even mm. though he mm. was brought up, uh, in abroad, but I mm. think he's been mm. always close to the people on the ground and they wanted the same leadership that his father had. So they've yeah. groomed him a bit for that. So I think that that, those two things may play, um, a part in, in being a thorn for the Taliban. We don't know yet how fast that's going to unroll. I think mm -hmm. more so the, the resistance rather than Amr la Saleh, we're still watching that cautiously. Um, second, in terms of, um, you know, if the, the U S does leave and, and the Taliban are to rule by themselves. I have no doubt that the situation will unfold similarly to North Korea, where um, and no one will hear anything from the inside, and their their lovely PR campaign will yeah. um, tell the world that everything's okay, and that anyone inside the country will be fearful of telling the truth of yeah. what's happening. Wow, that's. It's a very bleak scenario, but well within our possibilities. And all this unraveling happened in twenty years itself. It's like the cycle has just come around from where we started in November 2001 to, you know, here. And uh, the scary part is like you had people on Twitter saying, oh, yeah, yeah, they are at least doing press conference. And I'm like, that is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. At least they're doing press conferences. I mean, I mean, I was like, you're kind of trying to say as if like people had an option of going and asking the questions they wanted, or dressing up the way they want and go to the press conference. I mean, what sort of a ludicrous question is that? Um, but coming coming to coming to the human human humanitarian aspect of it, right? Because right now we are seeing that US has actually pretty much said that they are struggling to get out people who have helped US all these years, you know, interpreters, translators, uh, many local people, right? So are we to believe that they actually had no plan of how they were going to evacuate 10,000 people or were they just so completely caught unaware in 15 days that now they're like, oh my God, what do we do? Like, it is unbelievable. It's like you get out the troops and then put 3,000 troops back in or 5,000 troops back in to get people out because you had no idea what was going to happen. It's honestly shameful. It's honestly <sighs> shameful by the U.S. administration and the international community of how they did not have a plan. And as I think about it, as I'm getting sucked into more information, I wonder, and I'm going to put it out there, that this was a plan in itself to create the chaos so that, you know, a... a what is the word called that there's like smoke and fire and so things yeah. that can happen in the background to distract people um i i i will never forgive the us and the international community for doing this not only to their own people of, of being able to evacuate but to the afghan people and causing this fear and panic this could have gone completely different with a strong um transition and 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 smooth handover but it didn't and i i blame them 
Absolutely. I like it's it's terrifying. And I, I don't believe them at this point. They've made this tragedy unfold. And, you know, people are at the airport for as long as 36 hours with proper documents and cannot get on those planes. We've just heard <laughs> that for the next 48 hours, uh, the airport will be closed and for people not to go at all. You were hearing um, stories, horror stories, I may add, of uh, mothers lobbing babies over uh, the barbed wires. I mean, you have to understand the mental state of the people who are compelled to do such a thing. <clears throat> the The scary part is, the scary part amongst all is, is that there is not going to be a single domestic implication. I don't think Mr. Biden is going to lose a single vote domestically. And trust me, I'm not a fan of Mr. Trump. I think I've, I've, I've said this amply on the podcast. I view US politics with a very skeptical lens. I bash both of them equally and pray, commend them equally if they needed to. But my, my question is, um, I, I don't, un if this was done by Donald Trump, would the American media have lapped this up the way they have? And if the question is no, then it is reprehensible that sections of the media are not even asking questions. And if not for just for the Afghan people, uh, I mean, they should be asking for the Afghan people, the amount of American soldiers lost, who lost their lives. Because I don't know how their families are failing looking at this, because to them, it would almost feel like we lost our son, our, you know, our, our, our daughter, our, so many diplomats, you know, I, I mean, for no reason like they gave up their and this is not just giving up their life a lot of people had ptsd so injuries or something serving it's not been an easy road and go and ask an armed force member of of any country who has had to serve not just in afghanistan in any war what they feel if you know if the situation is like this so that's um that's that but you think i mean I, you agree right there's not going to be any domestic implication and that is why the administration is not even keen on like prolonging this issue. I mean, the press conference was an indication. Like, I think Mr. Biden didn't take any questions in the press conference. He gave a 15-minute statement where he stood by it, blamed everyone, and just left. Oh, that's a heavy question. You know, the last uh, five to six days have been a whirlwind um, yeah. in that I think most of the diaspora across the country, uh, and that's a lot, that's a couple hundred thousand of us, maybe up to, maybe 150, maybe 200,000 are in, in the US right now, but it may increase after um, mm -hmm. this situation. We have been feverishly working so hard that we can't even imagine <laughs> what a voter turnout could look like because at this point we don't care. But I think once we do get time to step back and think about it, we will... Because the one thing that has been beautiful about the last week is that we have come together. We have always worked in silos, but we are as united. Sadly, the trope of us being united for war uh, comes up again, even with the diaspora. But right. I think that we are so angry that we will work with the Muslim community to put that pressure, uh, that Muslim American community um, and, and voters and, and we will work side by side with veterans who feel betrayed. We will work side by side for friends with Afghanistan, with the Indian community, with Indian Americans to try to mobilize support. I don't know if it's going to, you know, uh, put a dent in his reelection. That's not necessarily what we want to do, but we want accountability and we want them to, you know, put pressure on the type of foreign policy agenda uh, that they're they're creating throughout the world because this is not just happening in afghanistan this has happened in several other muslim countries uh, or not even muslim countries we see it in south america and like we have to stop this whether it's him in particular that is the head focal point of this or if it's part of the establishment that is continuing this type of work Absolutely, absolutely. No, and I'll tell you this, like as as someone who's very um, close to what, you know, uh, India has done with Afghanistan in collaboration. And so, I mean, I saw on Twitter, someone was saying, ha ha ha, the Indian government that helped build a library in Kabul is being taken over. I'm like, buddy, if you're laughing about that, then the joke's on you. I, I honestly don't think, or, or the about the parliament, you know, that it's, it, and it, it's not just a, 
it's not just uh, financial or something like it's a very emotional investment as well because you were helping uh, you know rebuilding historically the relations have been very uh, interesting i mean a lot of like mr gani and mr karzai both were have their alma maters in delhi as well i i think at least mr karzai does i don't know mr mr gani does too but uh, maybe uh, under education i know under, under education, education. Yeah. but yeah 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 uh, the higher but something like so there has been an emotional connect right so it 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 does break my heart as well to see and 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 then to see uh in the west like afghans being blamed as if like some sort of a thing that oh they you know asked for it kind of thing you know with taliban it's 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 infuriating no one uh, afghans were lied to so there there's a couple things that you know we have to take into consideration uh, we we all know that afghanistan is is probably top 3 poorest country in the world um and and we know that a lot of people outside of kabul and the five main cities live in in poverty um and so when a new force comes in like let's say the taliban in in uh baghlan in the province of baghlan or tahar or kunduz and they're coming in and and they are um giving their form of justice or or you know if there's a dispute and the government actually cannot help them that are you know afghan government public services are not available or don't reach a certain communities and the Taliban use that as a vacuum to come in and show support and are able to help with local disputes yeah. Yeah. then like a sort of loyalty and allegiance happens because yeah. they are consistent in their approach in those villages and so yeah. what happens is there's that's one side of it right so people trust them more than they trust the government because they're able to get a direct response yeah. the yeah. other part of it is drone strikes you us and afghan drone strikes against the taliban what has happened is that afghans afghans have been caught in the middle of this and they're mm-hmm. angry that their brother their father their sister their child uh their mother has been killed here so that creates you know that resentment towards the us to want to potentially join the taliban but i will tell you i don't think that that is something that has happened to create the movement that the Taliban has it is very clear that they are trained in Pakistan like i'm just going to say it i i'm going to be as like direct um and and uh unapologetic as possible uh why are they trying to invade from the north and the east like they're coming from somewhere and i'm going to I know that some people there's political implications for it but not for me. Um it is it's honestly like I don't know it, it's heartbreaking because I feel like we are trying to raise our voice about this and no one is listening it's the side that's ignored. Um and that is why that you know the the hashtag sanction pakistan continued and we understand that we don't want sanctions to hurt the population of pakistan but we want to put political pressure in such a way to the government to stop their support and say that we're watching and we know what's happening um and it's on your hands and so that and there's even you know elements on top of that of people saying that their homes have been searched and people are speaking urdu why are they not speaking at least pashto if if that's the case yeah and 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 that's the thing i mean when you talk about the countries you're not talking about their population you're talking about establishment and when you talk about people you're not talking about the establishment you are talking about people and what they have to face and it's time that people view at this view um this in both terms that what is happening at a geopolitical or a country level and what is happening at a humanitarian level what the people have to face and when you make that those differences in the mind only then can you get to the bottom of the situation that what the afghan people are going to face and what we as a world are going to face uh, about who is in power like like um, you must said i mean i i personally don't even want to get into like like f- my first priority as a watcher would be the safety of afghan people and then we have all our lives to debate where are the attacks coming from who is yeah. exactly responsible and you know what should we do to mitigate this problem but if the afghan people are not safe then or if they have to revisit those five horror years then this is all for nothing because we can debate till it's 4 a.m in the morning here but uh, what, right. 
Yeah, but what good is it going to do if they're going to, you know, face the same, if we're going to push them in the same sort of black hole again and again? And that Absolutely. Is and and to your point of, of ensuring the safety of, of Afghans is, you know, one of the lobbying and advocacy points that I think uh, across the U.S. that we're trying to push for is one, um, expediting the, the SIV and P2 um, visa processes for those who are waiting in, in Afghanistan to be evacuated. Uh, two is to send uh, to create a humanitarian corridor at the Kabul airport to ensure a speedy process flow out. Um, three is to uh, send urgent humanitarian aid for the exacerbated IDP crisis. Um, and and those are like the three main pushes that, that we're asking. Oh, and also, sorry, four is to uh, widen the net for refugees to come into the country. Uh, that is the least that the U.S. can do for causing the situation. And, and have a proper mechanism by which that can happen. So it's, Absolutely. It's, 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 it's a very scary situation, but uh, we're all hopeful people, which we hope that we see light at the end of the tunnel. So I can only hope that that situation is true in this too. And there is some sort of miracle that happens geopolitically, strategy-wise. And let's not, let's not hope that the last 20 years of sacrifice of many so American soldiers, many American citizens, many Afghan citizens, many citizens across the world was, you know, for no reason. And the other, the, the ones that have survived, we don't want them to go back into what they came out of in 2001. Um, with that, oh, sorry, sorry, Lana, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry to be a pessimist, but I don't see any positive developments happening in the next year we'll see what happens and sadly yeah. I, I don't want this future for my people but I, I just it's not it's going to be bad on all fronts one thing i will ask you is and then this has been a truly fantastic and enriching conversation for me uh, that you please come back in a few months six months or maybe sooner or something and we have a follow-up conversation on i would love that I would because love that. Thank you. Um, because I, I I I hate talking about issues like this with people who have absolutely no understanding of what it takes to be on the ground and you know face face the situation. I mean, sometimes we have to do it. Sometimes we do it because you know. But when we are having this conversation, it is so many uh, thoughts that you know come into our heads as well. You know, so I, I really appreciate you taking out the time and doing this. I would like to go to you for any closing comments that you might have on this. Uh, any closing comments for our listeners, our viewers? Sure. No, I, I'd like to thank you for having me on this podcast because, one, it's important right now to amplify Afghan voices, whether it's in country or out. And please, you know, put emphasis on the diaspora right now because Afghans in country are fearful to come out on a live podcast or, or uh, share their voice because they don't want to be targeted in country. So that's what you'll see a rise of right now. So continue to, you know, talk and speak and share information. Um, I... We need your support at this time. We're a small country. We don't have a strong lobbying effort. So if we can count on your allyship and support for the many hundreds of years that we have been allies together of, of this, the, the listeners of this um, of podcast, uh, I know that that we will continue our efforts to, to create both yeah. wonderful, thriving societies for each other. Absolutely. So, you know, thank you. And, and if there's, I don't know, I'm happy to... I have a Twitter handle. People want to um, continue following yeah. updates and developments for Absolutely. either humanitarian support or political developments. Um, I, I'm happy to share with you. Um, please, uh, yeah, yeah, please. You can tell your Twitter handle, and you'll it'll be tagged as well when we plug the podcast from our handles and from the Mindmakers handle. Okay, so. great. So if you just type in uh, Kabul Sufi, that's me. Yeah, that's Kabul Sufi. So <laughs> On please. Twitter on twitter please please do consider following if you do like what you, if any even if you disagree engage with us if if you disagree with us please write to us we want to know like we don't pretend that we know everything this is all for a conversation who knows in disagreement we might find agreements or a new fact that might come to light so please please do write to us please comment on the video 
and uh, we'll be back very soon um, with a new podcast. Uh, well, Lema, I would really uh, thank you on behalf of MindMakers team for coming here and giving your perspective on the issues. We'll be back very soon with more podcasts uh, on Afghanistan. Like I said, guys, I don't pretend to know. It's more than my opinion on this. I would like to get a range of experts, get their opinion, get their perspective, and then you tell me what you think about those and we'll, we'll have more conversation. Thank you so much for coming. So we'll be back soon. Please like this stream, guys. Uh, follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook. Um, till then, it's goodbye.